Okay, this is going to be way less intimate than I had hoped. Um, yeah, of course. Um, but uh, so I'm kind of stuck up here clicking, but hopefully we can imagine ourselves to be a little bit closer. Uh, my name is David Morris. Um, I'm uh, currently a research postdoc at the University of South Florida. Um, and I am a very recent sort of, I've only very recently come into a sort of political self understanding relative to anarchism. So um, I'm kind of here at the conference as a whole to, to learn as much as possible more than anything. Um, but I did happen um, last year, well, for quite a few years now, um, I've spent a lot of time in Tokyo rel um, for the purpose of my own research. Um, and, you know, one of my interesting experiences now that I have come to identify more specifically with anarchism is looking back over the last 10 years of my life and seeing the um, organizations and people that I've um, felt drawn to and sort of affiliated with without necessarily explicitly identifying politically with them. Um, and one of them is definitely this group of people um, in Tokyo uh, who are um, explicitly anarchists, but at the time that I was spending time with them, they just seemed like the coolest people around doing stuff that mattered. Um, and, you know, I didn't necessarily identify with them in explicit political terms, but now I, now I sort of retroactively do. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, consider myself really lucky to have seen some of the stuff that went on um, over the course of several years. Um, and I think that it's, um, I'm just going to try and frame this as like a kind of a report of, of what's been going on to uh, maybe try and give people some ideas, some inspiration, um, things like that. Um, and I do uh, take a moment to point out that um, a lot of this research was funded um, by, and at the time I didn't necessarily consider it research, you know, like hanging out, but um, I was getting money from an organization called the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, which is actually a Japanese government body, um, which I guess is kind of a perverse point to make, but just that uh, there's, there's money for some of this stuff um, out there for people willing to look for it. Um, and none of this would have happened without that, so. Um, so the, uh, the first question that comes up when you talk about anarchism or any kind of radicalism in Japan um, is to do with perceptions of Japanese people or Japanese society um, as having a character of sort of inherent conformism or inherent authoritarianism um, especially um, in the in the West, there's um, a lot of perceptions of Japan as a, a sort of inherently culturally hierarchical society, um, and that comes out of, frankly, a lot of propaganda during World War II about um, how Japan in in World War II propaganda was um, sort of depicted as a nation of uh, sort of mindless drones um, or um, non-individuals under the direct control of the emperor. Um, so a lot of these ideas about, about Japanese society and Japanese people are the direct result of, of war propaganda. Um, the reality is that um, Japanese po modern political history um, is way more chaotic and frankly way more anti-authoritarian than the same period in, for example, American history. Um, for people who don't know the history, there was a, a major revolution um, in Japan um, in 1856. I might be getting that slightly wrong, but what's called the Meiji Restoration um, was a sort of overthrowing of the shogun um, system that had been in place for centuries um, and the institution or the installation of what eventually became um, a parliamentary democracy under a sort of figurehead emperor. Um, and uh, during that period, starting in the 1850s and on through um, the war, uh, there was a really strong tradition of anarchist and communist resistance in Japan. Um, probably the main, um, the most important figure is this guy, Shisui Kotoku, um, who did his most famous work around 1906. He started out as a Marxist um, and then actually um, came to the United States, uh, was affiliated with the IWW, um, and brought a lot of those ideas back to Japan. Um, in the more recent con, so, so there's there's a lot of um, early 20th century um, anarchist and radical work that goes on in Japan. Um, so there, there's a, there is a legacy of this, and um, a lot of it, um, for better or for worse, is extremely violent. 
Um, so there's a lot of political assassinations, there's a lot of peasant uprisings, um, there is, uh, a lot of it is um, anarchist, but a lot of it is also sort of right-wing agrarianism. There's a, there's a major peasant revolt that takes place in the early 20th century as well. Um, so there's this sense of, of real chaos um, that in, you could argue um, is actually the reason for the more authoritarian backlash that eventually led to um, the uh, rise of state Shinto and a lot of authoritarian impulses that led to World War II. Um, and then there's something quite similar that can be seen um, after the war, where you have a lot of really militant um, student resistance um, in the 1960s um, that sort of culminated in um, a really notorious group uh, called the Nihon Sekigun or the Rengo Sekigun, um, the uh, Japanese Red Army, um, which is a uh, I don't know how people feel about this term, but it's a, essentially a terrorist organization of Japanese nationals um, who were allied with, I'm not actually really clear on the details, but were allied with a lot of activist organizations um, and violent militants in um, Palestine. Um, and I've forgotten the name of the incident right now, but um, three members of the Rengo Sekigun in about 1976 opened fire in an Israeli airport and killed um, about 30 people, I want to say, with um, semi-automatic automatic gunfire and grenades. Um, and the, they were um, Japanese nationals. Um, and so one of the, the, the things to keep in mind when you're looking at the contemporary state of activism in Japan um, is that there's a sort of deep unease about um, a lot of forms of activism because there's such a legacy of violence. Um, and it's something that people from outside of Japan are probably not um, aware of in general. Um, another example um, is, uh, if anybody's ever been to Tokyo, you flew into Narita Airport, which is located pretty far outside of the city um, and was um, land, it's built on land that was expropriated from farmers. Um, and when that happened um, in, I believe, the late 70s, again, there was um, a pretty serious resistance movement to that expropriation, um, which again culminated in some pretty significant violence, including farmers firing rockets at planes taking off from that airport after it was completed. Um, and then after, um, after that period, um, what happened in the 1980s was this gigantic uh, sort of, well, 70s and 80s, was this huge economic boom that most of us are familiar with. There was a sort of um, bubble economy, is what the bubble era is what it's known as in Japan, um, based on uh, the same kind of inflationary banking practices that actually caused the, the 2008 financial crisis in the United States. Um, so you have this big bubble in the 1980s, a lot of dissent obviously in that kind of environment is repressed because everybody's just kind of enjoying the economy. Um, and then starting in the early 90s, uh, you have what's called the lost decade, um, where the bubble collapses, um, there's a huge economic contraction, um, and Japanese society as a whole goes through this long period and still continuing period of kind of self-reflection and wondering about kind of like what life is about. Um, people who had pinned their identity on uh, capitalist economic success through the 1970s and 1980s, um, and I mean this, sort of the entire nation um, coming out of the, what in Japan is really regarded as like a humiliation in World War II, um, the economic bounce back became a real crux of Japanese national identity um, through, the, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And then in the 90s when that seems to be on the verge of collapse, um, it sort of kicked off a lot of, um, not necessarily really high profile, but a lot of um, cultural self-reflection. Um, and so that's kind of the background to what we're talking about now. And one more, just like one example of um, the sort of self-reflectiveness and the, uh, the problems that came with the economic collapse of the last decade um, is this book, Kanzen Jisatsu Manyaru, which means um, The Complete Guide to Suicide. Um, it was published in 1993 and sold over a million copies. Um, Japan has the highest suicide rate in the industrialized world. Um, part of it is due to certain cultural um, norms where suicide is seen as a, a much more culturally acceptable thing to do um, when you're in trouble than in the United States um, or most Western cultures where 
um, religious and ethical boundaries tend to get crossed when you start talking about suicide. Um, and this is just a good quote as to kind of the general mind state of uh, people after um, the economic collapse, which actually took place in 1991. So this is like immediately post-bubble, people are already asking these questions about um, you know, why, why should we even bother to go on living? And that's kind of a, a reflection of the, the national mood, I think. Um, so the current condition um, is a little bit better. Um, the economy has bounced back over the last five to 10 years. Japan was not seriously impacted by the economic crisis. Um, but you do have um, a lot more um, temporary um, workers, a lot more what are known as freezers, um, which is a, a, a sort of portmanteau word of um, free and the German Arbeiter, uh, so free workers. And so that means um, yeah, part-timers, contract workers, etc., cetera, um, people who are really, really um, open for economic exploitation. Um, one thing to point out, and, and so there, there's this organization called the PAFF, which stands for Part-Time Arbeiter Free Foreign Worker, um, or what's better known as the Freezer Union, um, which is uh, an organizing effort. Um, it's based in Tokyo, uh, started in about 2004, um, as a, and, and it's a, it's a, um, I'll go in order. So one of the things that's important, um, at least for me, when I think as kind of like a sociologist about uh, the phenomenon of freezers is that a lot of these people are sort of economically marginalized, um, sort of by necessity they work in part-time jobs. Um, but there's also a lot of people um, who I met during my time there who are artists, who live sort of non-conventional lives, who uh, work on a contract basis because it allows them more freedom. Um, so there, there's sort of two sides to the coin there. Um, but the, the Freedom Union is, is um, in practice and in sort of background um, an anarchist organization. Um, they take their inspiration and declare their solidarity explicitly with the IWW. Um, if you go to um, the IWW website, you can actually see a letter that the Freedom Union sent to them to sort of state their position. Um, they're based largely on direct action, so um, I don't want to, I guess I don't want to show up right now. Um, but there's a, some good video if you do a, just a search on YouTube for Freeder Union um, of them um, really doing some awesome stuff. They just like, one, one of the things that they point out is that a lot of businesses in Tokyo where they're based that employ a lot of part-time workers are owned and operated by people who live outside of Tokyo. So um, they'll just like get in the van, five of them, and drive to sort of semi-rural Japan um, and like bang on the owner's door and stand outside and have their, their bullhorns out yelling about the working conditions that they're fighting against. Um, and so it's, it's a good video. Um, and uh, they also have, so, so there are sort of sub-unions within the Freeder Union. There's um, gas station workers and Kalakura, which means um, cabaret club. Um, so, and that's often um, women who work as sort of hostesses um, serving drinks and the sort of, sort of phenomenon of hostesses in Japan is too weird and complicated to go into, but basically they, um, they make money by having conversations with guys who just need company. Um, and so they've organized these pretty marginal groups. Um, and then um, again, something that you can check out if you see the video, um, they've also started um, a collective house um, called Freedom and Survival House that um, is just sort of inexpensive residence for politically active um, part-time and temporary workers. 